You know, I'm starting to think childhood and me just had bad taste. And what better way to segue into talking about the Dreamcast? Ah yes, rest in fucking pieces, you terrible, horribly designed, back-ass words piece of glorified trash. I never liked you. Sadly, most people disagree with how I feel about the Dreamcast, and they have good reason to. The Dreamcast library had some pretty good games. That's why it had such a long life sp- Awww. It's funny how that works. Much to the dismay of Dreamcast aficionados everywhere, the console got discontinued in 2001, and that left a good deal of stellar titles homeless. Well, around that time, every other console manufacturer said, Hey, we got a console just like that, except it looks nicer, runs games more efficiently, and the controllers don't feel like you're holding roller coaster lap bars. And lo, many Dreamcast titles migrated to the consoles we actually still enjoy to this day. Smear campaigns and burning hatred for an inanimate object aside, of the many games to make this transition were Evolution, The World of Sacred Device, and Evolution 2 Far Off Promise, a couple of dungeon crawlers developed by Sting Entertainment. How or why Nintendo got the exclusive rights to put these games on the GameCube? I don't know, and I don't care. But both games were stitched together as a single title named Evolution Worlds and released on the console in 2002. Now these games were originally released in 1999, and I feel in order to establish just how old these games are, you only need to look at the opening logo screens. This was back when Ubisoft was two words. That's how long it's been. This entire video is going to be a mixed bag of do's and don'ts, but Evolution Worlds does start with something that I always love when RPGs do it. The very first thing that happens when you hit new game is your first battle. You wanna know what kind of game this is? Boom, here you go. This is the kind of stuff you'll be doing a lot of. Do you like it? Good, there's like 23 more hours of this if you're interested. You gotta love a game that doesn't waste your time. So after that, the game proceeds to waste our time. Meet our main character, Mag Launcher, accompanied by his friend Linear. Mag's an adventurer, someone that explores ancient ruins in search of high-tech machines called Cyframes. Although it seems this time someone's beat him to it. Well, well, Mag Launcher. Still going on adventures with that scaredy cat girl, huh? Chain, how did you get here? And where did you get that treasure? You shouldn't even be here interrupting my work. The ruins are off limits to amateurs. It's that temper of yours that makes people mistake you for a man. Uh, mm, Mag, buddy, that was a bit uncalled for, wasn't it? Mm. Luckily, the ruins start collapsing in on themselves to save Mag from the massive internet backlash he would have likely received had the conversation continued. Yeesh, you think they would have tried a little harder than Star Trek did. Main cannons have breached the outer hall! Retreat out of Floor Factory 6! I would just like to add that that is my second Star Trek joke in a month. Mag and Linear return home empty-handed and are greeted by Mag's butler, Gray. I see. You reach your destination and are about to begin collecting the treasure. But Chain Gun beats you to it. Your mission ends in failure, and you get nothing from the society. Uh, that about sums it up, yes? Uh, yeah. We just played through that. Mag, you don't know the importance of your position as head of the Launcher family. Or do I just worry too much? Um, hey, Gray, I'm standing right here, you know. Nonetheless, I have served the Launcher family for many years. I have seen many adventurers. Oh no, the exposition has become so heavy-handed it's starting to ignore the story. My experience tells me that his puzzling confidence is the unmistakable mark of a true leader. You could say he is a magnif- Someday he will grow into a magnificent adventurer. <sighs> Why am I even here? So after Grey chews him out, Mag heads right back to the Society, an archaeological firm that hands out missions to adventurers. It's there we meet another adventurer named Pepper Box. I'm sure it is. Yes, well, anyway. <laughs> oh, that side frame looks like it's seen a lot of use. I guess you could say he's in good With you in charge, the Launcher family is surely in good hands. Knock him dead, kid. 
That was my joke. My joke. Very funny. You know everything, don't you? After all, you're pretty much a veteran at the society. Veteran? Are you referring to my age? I resent that. I just have a lot of experience here. Unlike the people sent from the other offices, I was born in this town. A lot of experience? That's a veteran. I understand perfectly. You ever listen to two people have a conversation and get the feeling they're actually computer programs playing back lines recorded by actors from a script written by a starving writer who desperately needed to write a story to buy food for his family and purchase his wife a nice dress for when they go visit his in-laws to avoid being asked about their financial situation so that he can retain what very little pride or dignity is left inside the slowly rotting husk that he calls a body? No? Maybe it's just me. Enough beating around the box. The game's dialogue or story or whatever the hell you want to call this train wreck is terrible. No one sounds real. Most of the dialogue is just exposition that gets repeated ad nauseum to pad out the space in between dungeons. Even when characters are talking directly to one another, they can't go more than a single box of text without trying to sneak in a piece of factual information that adds nothing to what's going on. I would blame this on bad localization, but you can have a bad translation and still parse together what was originally meant. In this game's case, what was meant was also equally as bad as how it was translated. Which I guess would mean that the localization did a good job. Huh. Wait, launcher? As in, Mag Launcher. Like, the weapon. Come to think of it, that girl's name was Chain Gun. Mag Launcher, Chain Gun, Pepper Box? Does that mean the butler's name is Grenade? Oh my god! Bad naming conventions, terrible puns, exposition overload... <gasps> I don't have any material for the episode! Shit's fucked! We made emergency procedures! Go! 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 So after about 20 minutes of being put through a third grade play written by Steve's dog, we finally get to the gameplay part of this thing we call a video game. And it's not entirely okay. You know how dungeon crawlers work, right? Run around fighting monsters until you find a staircase that takes you to another floor. Rinse and repeat. In its most basic form, that sounds like it can get pretty boring, right? That's why good dungeon crawlers try to have a deep combat system or interesting dungeoneering mechanics that keep the player engaged. Evolution Worlds tries to do both of those things, but it mostly falls flat on its face trying to impress you. For starters, these dungeons suck. Really, it's less of a dungeon and more a poorly developed maze. Claustrophobic hallways that lead to rooms that funnel out into more claustrophobic hallways. The whole process of going from tunnel to tunnel is uncomfortably long. You just want it to be over after four or five of these floors. There's only about three or four rooms per floor spread out as far as possible to make every level unnecessarily large. Each one is just stuffed with enemies and treasure chests. This is normally a good thing, but when the hallways are so thin that the camera loses sight of the player, you want the rooms to be nice open areas that entice the player to find them. Instead, you have a small room with things in it that take up about half the real estate and your immediate reaction is to get the hell out of there. Oh god, it's like the walls are closing in on us! Your inventory space is extremely limited as well. There's only 30 slots and you'll average 6 to 8 treasure chests per floor, so although most of the dungeons don't go past 15 floors, you'll have to start managing inventory before you even get halfway through most of them. There's also floor traps, which I admit is a nice way of keeping the player on their toes, but they're littered across the dungeon and are especially in hallways. There is a jump button for the exact purpose of avoiding them, but since being able to see the traps in the hallways means having to come to an absolute stop, to rotate the camera, to be able to see the hallway clearly every time the hallway takes a turn, you're better off hugging the wall and narrowly avoiding it. There are some interesting mechanics in later dungeons that I'd like to talk about. Like trap rooms that seal off when you enter them, requiring you to fight all the enemies in it before you can leave. Some of these contain rare items or apply constant status effects like poison or paralysis to your characters in battle and present a mini challenge of sorts. You can also find holes in the ground that drop you into previous floors and some floors have areas with rare items that can only be accessed by falling through these holes. These are clever ways to get more use out of your dungeons from a design perspective, but because because the dungeons in Evolution Worlds are so awful, as a player, this is just a masochistic waste of time. 
After you clear the first dungeon, Mag and Linear head back home for a well-earned rest and therapy to treat their onset claustrophobia. During their therapy session, the conversation shifts to Mag's father and his departure to search for Evolution, a legendary Psyframe. Ah yes, I remember that night one month after your father disappeared at the ruins. It's hard to believe that three years have gone by since that night Linear first came. Gee, I wonder what or who Evolution could be. The next morning, Butler McPlotmover informs Mag that the 8th Imperial Army has requested his help on information about Evolutia. So they go meet the 8th Imperial Army and its commander. I am the Divine Crown Prince of the 8th Empire, inheritor and direct descendant of the Leopold Dynasty. It seems that your father, Asrock Launcher, might have already discovered something extremely important relating to Evolutia. Gee, I wonder what or who that could be. Yeah, there's one more thing I would like to ask. I was wondering, would you give Linear over to me? I'm sure she would be very happy serving as my maid. That Eugene guy's really weird. He gives me the creeps. But that linear girl, she was so pretty. I'd love to have her around always. So after that... That... Mag and Grey decide to creepily stare at Linear from afar as she plays on an ocarina. Linear then heals a flower by the wayside and conveniently the Imperial Army receives massive scanner readings indicating the presence of a legendary psi frame at the launcher estate. <laughs> what that could be? Hey, wait a minute. No one ever told me that Linear had that kind of talent. What are you talking about? I've used that healing spell like a hundred times in battle by now. The battle system in Evolution Worlds is pretty bland. It's your standard turn-based RPG stuff with a position grid playing a very minor role. Your party rests on a 3x3 grid of columns and rows with the option to move up or down their respective column. The farther up a party member is, the more damage they deal and receive. The enemies have their own grid with four columns instead of three, but adhere to the same rules. Some of your skills take advantage of the grid system by allowing you to attack multiple enemies in the same row or multiple columns at once, and other skills have unique patterns of attack that target specific spaces on the grid. To get skills, you have to earn tech points, which you get every time you complete a battle in addition to experience points. The faster you complete a battle, the more tech points you earn, and that's... it. Aside from giving you various ways to target multiple enemies, it doesn't make much of a difference and the game's really easy already. I can't think back to an enemy aside from a boss that I couldn't kill in one or two regular attacks and since you're swamped with enemies on every floor, you outlevel everything in the next dungeon by the time you're done with the one you're currently in. Actually, most of my game I was saving up tech points for when I would actually need them and eventually I gave up any pretense that the game was going to get difficult and just spent them all to make fighting regular enemies go by quicker. After exploring another dungeon, Mag comes home to find that Eugene has taken Grey hostage and demands that Linear come with him. She holds the key that will unlock the mysteries of ancient civilizations. She will benefit all humankind. Talking about. What are you fucking kidding me? Mag and Linear then run away, Mag telling Grey he'll be back for him and the army chasing after them. They make their way to the landing field just outside the launcher estate. Mag prepares to fight a tank and hey, whoa, did we just cross into a Final Fantasy FMV? Don't mind us, we're just playing through. Video game, there's like a hundred tanks planning on killing one child and he's about to get hit by an errant tank shell. I don't think now is the time for cartoon sound effects and comedic timing. Mag blacks out and later wakes up in his bed and Grey explains to Mag that after the army kidnapped Linear, the Imperial fleet departed into open waters. Resolved to rescue her, Mag assembles his ragtag team of people we don't care about to go save Linear. They hop into their seaplane and head for the Imperial cruiser. This seems like it's moving a little fast, right? For some reason, when they decided to sell both games as one title, they spliced the two together, cutting a lot of content from both. I have no idea why. There are plenty of other titles for the GameCube that were bigger in size. Heck, Tales of Symphonia used two discs. 
The only reason that would make sense is that someone up in marketing didn't think the games would sell well as two individual ports, but if you were going to package them together anyway, why not just keep both full games on separate discs? And don't bother trying to defend the confusing dialogue and exposition as a byproduct of them cutting content from the game. I did my homework and checked out the Dreamcast version. It's in that one too. So after they fight a few battles on the ship, they finally get to Eugene. The gang beats him handily. Or have they? Are you ready to face my wrath? Now that you've pushed me this far, goodbye! After giving chase, they corner Eugene, who uses Linear as a hostage, taking the time to explain to them the truth. I don't know how or where he did it. Her father, Asrock Launcher, had already obtained the legendary Psyframe three years ago. In other words, he had found Linear, who is also Evolution. The ultimate Psyframe, Evolution, superior to all others, is not a machine, but Linear. I just can't believe it! You see that face? That's the face of a fucking idiot. Evolution Worlds is not a bad game. It's a bland game that's made worse due to awful story elements and boring level design. I liked Mag's character design though, so I guess that's... something? I can't believe it! I had an idea for a miniseries where I talked about games from a specific time in my childhood. Mystic Heroes was a game I had almost completely forgotten about and served as an example of our tendency to forget the mediocre titles of the past in order to glorify it. Metropolis Mania was supposed to be that hidden gem we all spent a week playing and then forgot about, but it ended up being the game that wasn't as good as how we remembered it. Evolution Worlds was always a game I was confused about. I don't remember particularly enjoying it, but only now do I understand why. So let's keep the trend going, shall we? Let's talk about something that I thought was going to suck chunks at first, but ended up being one of my favorite games of all time. Let's talk about something that combines Mystic Heroes, Metropolis Mania, and Evolution Worlds, and does it all right. Let's talk about Dark Cloud. Thanks for watching another episode of GC Positive. I hope you enjoyed this one because it was a pain in the butt to make. If you'd like to see more, you can click on either of the two videos you see on screen, or you can go through my channel and peruse my content. And if you'd like up-to-date information on videos, my channel, what I'm thinking of, what games I'm playing, etc., you can find me on these social media sites by following the links in the description. And don't forget that you can always show your support by liking the video, subscribing to my channel, watching the videos, telling your friends, rating me on Dig Dug, whatever the fuck people are using today, I don't know. But above all, always remember that my name is GC, that you are amazing, and I'll see you all next time.